if, uh, if you want to, I'm going to be in Colossians chapter 2. I'm going to be jumping around quite a bit, but we're going to be st- focused in Colossians chapter 2. How, did y'all have that real bad storm come through here? Man, let me tell you, I missed it. How many are in King William? How bad was it? It was bad. Now, I left Bella's, and I had a free night, Jason. My 5 o'clock canceled. My 7 o'clock canceled. It's 4.30. I'm going to go home and get the best Japanese sushi you can get at Food Lion. <laughs> and... Uh, I was going to sit down for about an hour, maybe two, and watch some Miami Vice, the old ones from the 80s, and get some work done so I could have some free time on Saturday. And as I was driving down the road, there was all these police out, electrical trucks, trees down, trees across the road. I get to food line. They're waving me, so you can't come in. I said, what do you mean I can't come in? I, I got sushi to get. <laughs> Power is off. Do you know those stone trash cans that are in front of Food Lion? They were blown over. Ah, it was crazy. Get home, there's no power. That's right, no sushi and no Miami Vice. And uh, the, the driveway was just scattered. Uh, my, my landlady was trying to clean up, so I spent the rest of that night cleaning up. And some of the best made plans can be turned on a dime just like that. When we get married and we have kids, and we have that first child, we know all the plans that we have for them. And then something happens. Their personalities show up. <laughs> and then we're, we're realizing they're their own person, and, and all these great plans we had kind of gets all these curveballs thrown at us, and we're doing more work than we, we ever thought. Um, we're going to look at Colossians, and I don't know if y'all have thought about this. There's been a huge attack on the Word of God. Now, listen, this has all been prophesied, so I'm, part of me gets pumped because we're seeing prophecies unfold that were made thousands of years ago, and they're all coming true. There's been a huge attack on the Bible, and um, a lot of the young people are calling me because, sadly, they're getting all their truth from TikTok. Um, we're getting our truth from Facebook. Don't make fun of them. Um, and we hear something and we go, well, it must be true. Every book in your Bible is written for a problem or a situation that is innate to humanity itself. So there's something in humanity that we feel we need to earn. Acceptance, prestige, even righteousness before God. We've got to work to be acceptable to God. And so God gives us the book of Romans to teach us that Christ alone is our righteousness. Uh, We live in a world where there's all these different ideologies and philosophies and these different people talking. And and what we tend to do is try to blend that into the church. And I hear it said a number of different ways. You know, God did give us his word, but he also gave us a brain to think with, which is code for I can judge God's word and change it to how I want to fit into the world. And so the book of Corinthians is written for that. Um, there's suffering and evil in this world. Would you agree? There's a whole book written on that, Peter. First and second Peter. There's a class of Christians and churches that feel they're superior to other people. Um, Jesus said this, out of the heart comes the words of the mouth. And you can tell by the way people talk about other Christians if they think they're up here or if they think they're down here. You can hear it in preaching. You know, if I sit up here and go, you know, people, I know y'all don't read your Bible, but I read mine every day. That's up here talk. I'm better than you. Kind of judging you. The book of Ephesians is to, to show us all, no, we're all one in Christ. There is no varsity and JV team. It's all because of what Christ has done. Colossians is about recognizing that we have a tremendous need and it's Christ and Christ alone, and then we try to find it in other things. And what Colossians teaches is the knowledge of Jesus Christ is sufficient and complete. He's done a finished work. We need to rest in him, but we want to add to it. 
good. I'm, Christ has saved me now. I've got to work hard enough to keep that good grace. That, no, he's bought that. You're secure. Yeah, but I need to become the most excellent at theology. No, it's Jesus Christ. Well, I need to read my Bible and pray more. Yes, if you're learning about Jesus Christ. And what I'm going to challenge you with today, fathers, is something that I'm seeing that's disturbing me. And I don't know if it's just me getting older or I'm just seeing the damage that's done by this. In a lot of churches, we're forgetting about Christ. He's not the focus. And if you think I'm wrong, just sit and listen to a bunch of Christians, what they talk about. I just read a great book by Tony Evans. It's one of the best books I think I've ever read. He's, you know, he's up there about Andy Stanley. You know, Andy Stanley once said, no, 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 no. Listen, you've got to get rid of Andy Stanley. John Piper is the foundational truth giver in this generation on this. And we're quoting everybody, but we're not talking about who? Jesus Christ. If you listen in non-Christian circles and Christian circles, you hear this word a lot, God. Do you believe in God? Oh, yeah, I believe in God. God's real. Man, the man upstairs, God's great. But you don't hear a lot of people talking about Jesus Christ. You can be in a group of lost people, and they'll be talking about philosophy and Buddhism or Taoism or all that, and even Christians will try to engage in that, and they will say things like this, well, what's your view on God? But I don't hear them saying this. Well, what's your view on Jesus Christ? Colossians is saying Christ is central. And so starting in verse 1, for I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you. Paul's writing to a number of churches in this area, and he's letting you know I'm struggling. There's a conflict. Whenever we share truth about anything, there's a conflict. And those in Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, and attaining all the riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Jesus Christ. He's struggling, and this is what he's saying he's doing. I'm struggling because I want your hearts to be encouraged I want you knit together in love. I want you to attain all the riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge and the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Jesus Christ. Paul said, I want you to have a full assurance, a confidence of the precise understanding of what Jesus has done. If you do not have that as a Christian, everything else will get off. Your view of God will get off. Your view of yourself will get off. Your view of the Bible will get off. Everything will get off if your view of Christ is wrong. In Mormonism, do they believe in Jesus Christ? Yes. And his brother Satan. And they're both children of Elohim, but they're no different than me and you. And we too can become a God like them. Their view of Christ is totally wrong. Jehovah Witnesses, I believe it used to be. I haven't studied it in a long time. He was, he was an angel. New Age, Jesus is the one that shows us how to become a God. If your view of God is wrong, it's because your view of Christ is wrong. And Paul's saying this is very important. I want you to understand this. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things are passing away. Behold, all things become new. And when you know Jesus Christ and understand his life, his death, his resurrection, his deity, his justifying you, forgiving you, and giving you new life, then everything else falls into place. So your view of God is, is not academic or philosophical. You recognize he's a person that can be known. Your sin nature, you realize that the real issue that you're struggling with isn't your willpower. You just got a sin condition. Jesus Christ has come not only to forgive it, but to overcome it. All of it falls into place. Look at verse 3. Talking about Christ still. In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. 
I'm going to skip. I had a thing I was going to preach there, but I'm going to skip that. Let's keep, well, let's go. Man struggles with purpose, who he is, what, what, is, what am I here for? And last week we talked to our graduates about having a compass. Your purpose determines your compass. If my purpose is to be happy, what does my compass point to? Whatever is going to make me happy. So if drugs are going to make me happy, I'm going to be okay with that. And if that doesn't work and it's women, then women will be. If that doesn't work, then it's, and that's my compass. All I'm looking for is something to make me happy. And man throughout the centuries, starting at Plato and Socrates, have philosophy, all these philosophies of what is the purpose of man? What is the way he's to live? How is he supposed to go about doing this? And, and then it, it goes on to Kant and other people, and they're all speculating. What is man to be and to do, and how is man to act, and what is going to give him purpose? And you know what they've all come up with? Nothing. Because they don't have the right purpose. They have a wrong compass. So some of those philosophers say this. Eat, drink, and be merry. Tomorrow you die. Live it up. You only live once. You only get one go around. Do it all. And that makes everybody happy. Right, church? No. There's some that say it's about discipline and self. Let me give you an example of this. Tom Cruise is a perfect example of this. Your life is defined by the discipline you put yourself under. And your life choices and the direction of your entire life is based on how well you can discipline yourself. Is he happy? He couldn't keep Katie Holmes. And listen, he loved her. She loved him. But you can't live like that. Doesn't work. And all the philosophers say, what is man? What is God? What is, what is life? And what Paul is saying is all this hidden treasure and wisdom and knowledge you're looking for is in Jesus Christ. Period. And without Christ, you can have all the college degrees, all the success, all the knowledge, everything, and still be empty and a failure. And Paul's saying in verse 3, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Look at verse 4. Now this I say, lest any of you should deceive, uh, be deceived uh, with... Perse- pers- I'm sorry. Now this I say, lest any of you should deceive you with pervasive words or persuasive words. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. We live in a nation right now and in a world right now. He who has the best argument wins. Would you agree? But here's the problem in America. And I want you all to hear this because this is a big problem and it's getting bigger. If there's only one voice and there's only one perspective, it's going to seem right. The Bible says the first one to plead his case seems right until another comes and cross-examines him. Proverbs 18, 17. My granddaughter is notorious for this. This is going to make a point. This is how my granddaughter, my granddaughter will throw you under the bus in a second. We had, they had a piano recital here last night. Michelle was working really hard. She didn't have time to go by food line. They're supposed to bring stuff with the thing. Well, there's the tables kind of set. So Michelle goes, you know what? I can, we're just not going to say anything because it's all out and nobody will be the wiser. And Mia did this. Miss Coburn, my mom didn't get a cake because she didn't have time to go get it, so she didn't bring anything. <laughs> Threw her right under the bus. I take her to Chick-fil-A the other day, and she tells Nikki and Michelle this. Augie bought me the 12-piece chicken nugget meal for me. And they went, what? Gave her a 12-piece meal? Yes, Mia, tell him the rest of the story. He gave me a 12-piece meal. It's Mia. And Augie ate five of them. <laughs> Let me read that verse again. The first one to plead his case seems right until another one comes and cross-examines him. 
with Paul said, don't let anybody deceive you. We're, I'm noticing this, and I think y'all are noticing this. We, let me give you a statement. The lazy are easily destroyed. Would you believe that? Is that true? The lazy are easily destroyed. Is that true? Yes. Because they, they become dependent. Many of us, let's say all of us, really don't take time to study anything and we could be easily deceived. Would you agree? Let me tell you the calls I'm getting from parents. I've never had this before. I'm getting them. Hey, I've got a question. It says homosexuals, homosexuality is never mentioned in the Bible and it's not even a sin. Where are you getting that from? My kid just came in here and told me that. Really? Who told him that? I don't know. Somebody told him that. No, I think they came up with that on their own. No, they didn't. Ask them where they got it from. Let's see. We'll take a poll. Where did that kid learn that information? Say it loud. TikTok. Here's another one. There was no universal flood. There's no evidence for it. As a matter of fact, it's a myth that was manufactured to control people from powers of institution like the church. Where'd they get that from? TikTok. Now, what we do is we try to get an answer for that, but I've got a deeper question for you. Why are your kids getting that and the lost kids not? The kids on the street I'm talking to don't get any of those. Let me ask you another question. Who's controlling the information that's coming through TikTok? Say it, Shelby, because you're right. China. 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 Do you know what the Chinese show their kids on TikTok? Do-it-yourself projects. Learning how to play symphony instruments. People learning mathematics and equations and how to execute higher learning, how to strive for excellence as an individual. What are they showing the American kids? Jump. Jump. So you talk to the kid and say this, well, does the Bible say that homosexuality, let me ask you, church, does the Bible say homosexuality is a sin? Yes. Here's the argument. You ready? This is on TikTok. When did that word come into existence? Homosexuality. Oh, that came out in the 40s. If that word was in the 40s, did it exist in Bibles before then? Not if the word didn't exist. Matter of fact, that's a false translation that people in control put there to persecute homosexual people. That's all your kids hear, and no one challenges them. The word dinosaur in your Bible? The word dinosaur didn't exist until the late 1800s. And there's people on TikTok doing this. The Bible doesn't say dinosaurs exist. It's an antiquated book. It's stupid. It's non-scientific. I don't know why you're reading it. Find the word dinosaur in there and I'll give you a million dollars. And your kids come to you and say, is this true? And sadly, we go what? We call the pastor. Now, I'm not busting your chops, but this is what our kids are dealing with. We don't take time to question anything. Let me show you one that a kid showed me uh, the other day in the restaurant. The Bible is incomplete because it kept out specific gospels like the gospel of Peter and the gospel of Thomas because it didn't like the message those books had and they used it against the church and because of the church's prejudice, they took books out of the Bible. Now, what that argument just did is it totally eliminated the authority of the what? The Bible. And so this is what I asked them. When was the Gospel of Thomas and Peter written? Same time the other ones were? No, you're a little wrong. It's a little bit later. And the Gnostics wrote those. Do you know who the Gnostics are? No. They were somebody that didn't believe in the Word of God and said God spoke directly and everything was mystical. That's why those books were kept out. Did you know that? No. Did they talk about the Gospel of Barnabas? No. Yeah, that was another Gnostic book. 
Did you know the church was fighting the Gnostics because they said Christ wasn't really Christ at all? Well, no, I didn't know. They didn't say any of that. It, but what worries me, church, is these kids are totally dependent on what? An argument. And listen, our kids are not going to be going online to re- listen to a sermon. They're flipping through TikTok to watch somebody trip somebody up. And then they come across that and it plants it in their head. And then they're a wreck. Some of y'all in here, and I know who you are, you know who you are, have called me because your kids have seen that stuff. Mia saw some stuff on YouTube the other day, and she was asking me about it. And I said, well, sweetie, I said, they're kind of lying in a sneaky way. What do you mean? And I explained it to her. She goes, that is sneaky. I said, isn't it? It hurt my feelings, Dean. She said this, they're sneaky like you, Augie. (laughs) Now, listen, Paul's saying, look, I don't want you to be deceived by these fine-sounding arguments. Verse 5. And we live in a world, this is going to get worse. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and your steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Second Thessalonians says something else. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold to the traditions. Here he's saying the good order. Hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. Are we a traditional church? Yeah, we are. Matter of fact, we've got a couple people upstairs and a couple people downstairs. They're used to the praise bands and the music and all that stuff. And they come here and they go. We're thinking, man, we're progressing pretty good because we just got some screens in. But we're still singing the what? Hymns. We're trying to do a blend because we, we need to do a blend, church. We need to do a blend. Are traditions bad? No, it just depends on where the traditions are. Is progressiveness bad? No, it just depends on what we're progressing in. I'm going to give you something really easy to help Christians. You ready? When it comes to things that are out in the world, let me give you some examples. Like technology. We want to be progressive in that. I am so thankful I can film this and go home and post it and all these people can see it. That's, that's progress. We're progressing in that area. That's technology. I am thankful unto God my children don't know how to fold up a road map. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Billy, have you ever used that, trying to drive, look at a map while you're driving, unfolding it, finding where you are? It's a nightmare. I am so thankful. Siri goes, turn and four point. Thank you, Siri. I can go, get me home. And it takes me home. Pull it up on the phone. Now, if the phones don't work and we lose all power and technology's gone, there's going to be a lot of people lost. They're never going to find their way home because they can't read a what? Map. But are you glad we have GPS? Are you glad we have phones that are not attached to the wall? (sighs) Aren't you glad that you can go in? I went into the hospital and they wanted to check my heart and they went in through my leg and checked my heart and they did it in about a couple of minutes. Aren't you glad they could do that instead of cutting me open and busting my ribs apart? And those things, that's progress, progressiveness, if you will. But when it comes to things that God has said, we need to rest on those traditions. A tradition isn't bad or good. It just depends on whose it is. If it's God's tradition, we need to hold on to it. If it's men, we need to question it. We need to advance with it. And sometimes we need to throw them out. And listen, we have traditions here that some of those things need to be thrown out. The pulpit wasn't here this morning when I got here. It is a lot easier to pull out a little stand and just put it here and preach from that. But listen, some of y'all are locked in to the tradition that this pulpit isn't here. We're not having what? Church. That's tradition of God, right? tradition of men. Look at verse 6. This is all going to make a point, I promise. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus as the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as you have been taught, 
abounding in it with thanksgiving. Verse 8, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy or empty deceit according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Jesus Christ. For in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. Father's Day is a reminder that we as dads need to be rooted and built up in one thing, and that is Christ. That's the key. Paul is trying to make a point. In the book of Colossians, he talks about you can have philosophy, you can have religion, you can have prosperity, you can have mysticism and all that. It's all going to leave you empty. Everything is Jesus Christ, period. That's the whole purpose of this book. And in the Old Testament, God gives a a prophecy says, Behold, I will send Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord. Talking about when the Lord comes. And you know what the purpose of the prophet of Elijah is? It says this in, in uh, Malachi 4 6. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. We live in a world and we live in a culture that has gotten something really backwards. And I know I'm going to make some people mad today, but it's okay. It needs to be said. Dads are vital in God's plan. Matter of fact, in order for a good revival to take place, the men have got to be moved. He says in that proverb, I mean in, in Malachi that I just read to you, that before the great day of God comes and the final stuff happens, Elijah the prophet's going to come and get the fathers, so their father's hearts turn back to the children and the children's heart turn back to the fathers. That's a big deal. Do you know what we do in our culture, and some of us do it as wives, we bust on the fathers. We make fun of the fathers. We mock the fathers. Don't tell him. He don't know what he's doing. Come here, I'll take care of it. You told who? Good luck getting that done. And, and listen, ladies, the men are under stresses they'll never share with you because men just don't share stuff from the heart like they should. But they're under tremendous burdens sometimes. They're just trying to keep their head above order. And then there's the ribbing. Oh, and then if you watch TV, how are the dads on TV? Don't! That's how most of the dads are. Homer Simpson. Think about it. How, many, how, how long has it been since there's been a good, healthy, wise, productive, responsible, uh, fix-the-problem dad on a sitcom? Father knows best. Father knows best. I mean, seriously, think about that. But if I said this, name a sitcom where the father has no clue, he's stupid, he... you can start naming them. Especially the one that sits on the couch and puts his hand down his pants while he watches TV. God says, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the father to the children and the hearts of the children to the father unless I, sli unless I strike the land with a curse. Men, the best thing that we can do as dads and as men is not learn all these things and go to all these conferences and do this and do that. It's simply abiding in Christ and keeping him central. Jesus said this, If you abide in me and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. When they were going into the promised land, God comes to Joshua and he gives a command. This is what he says to Joshua. Be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to right or to left that you may prosper in whatever you go, wherever you go. 
This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, that you may observe to do all according that's written in it. For then I will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God will go with you. Psalm 1 says this, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Listen to this, this is very important. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water and bring forth fruit in its season. We emphasize as churches you need to read your Bible. Would you all agree? And 90% will do that just so they can have a clear conscience and say my duty's done. But how many delight in reading it? There you go. Now there's a reason that we delight. It's how we come to it. And, and what I want to challenge you men and ladies, this is for everybody, is when it talks about meditating on God's Word and reflecting on it, it means reading it and, and really just questioning and thinking and digging into it. Let me read you this from John 5, and I'm going to drive the point home, and then we'll go. But you do not have His Word abiding in you. He's talking to the religious leaders. Because whom He sent... Him, you did not believe. Talking about whom God sent into the world, you did not believe. And then Jesus says something that's, that's just disciplinary. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. There's a lot of people that search the scriptures to know how to argue. There's a lot of people that search the scriptures so they can know end time prophecy. There's a lot of people that search the scriptures to see how they can defeat somebody they disagree with. But what Jesus is referring to here is something pretty powerful. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. I read the Bible so because I want to get close to God. I want to have eternal life, if you will. And these are they that testify of me. Your whole Bible testifies of Jesus Christ, every word in it. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have eternal life. I've been in ministry a long time. I'm getting old. I've learned something in ministry. In churches, there's two types of Christians. There's a lot of different, but there's two ones that I see that, that cause problems. One is the Bible is a purely intellectual exercise, and they know their Bible backwards and forwards. I get emails from people like this. This is how the emails go, and I'm not making this up. This is stuff I get at home in my emails. Pastor, that was a great sermon today. However, the illustration you used to point to that scripture, I think you totally missed the point of that verse. That verse is parsed in a certain way. It means a past action that has ongoing results, and you didn't use that word that way in your sentence. Now listen, I look, and sometimes they're right, sometimes they don't know what they're talking about. The best way to catch somebody is to Google what they said, and you can find out where they stole it from. What I do is I look at their life. Are they leading people to Christ? Are they humble? Do they delight in God's word? Are they talking about Jesus? These intellects, some of them have gone to seminary and school, and they're brilliant. But they're some of the most divisive, hard-hearted. They hop from place to place to place to place. They can't find a home. They can't make really good close friends. Because everybody else is wrong. Then there's this other Christian that causes problems in churches. This is how this works. Pastor, um, God gave me a sign. Okay? Yeah, I flipped a quarter five times. I called heads. And five times it was heads, so I know this is what God wants me to do. Okay, what does he want you to do? He wants me to send my kids away off Germany because I can't deal with them anymore. But it was a sign given to me. Now, we laugh at that. But I know a lot of Christians that they will see a sign in anything that God will prove to me what I want, and it causes problems in the church. I joked with y'all years ago, I used to pray to God, God, if this is the girl, play this song on the radio. There's the song. It's from God. 
Now, the girl's bad. She's a two-timer. She's lying. All the signs that God's Word says stay away from doesn't matter because Peter Tira came on the radio. What God is saying is when we read God's Word and we're spending time in the Bible, we're spending time getting to know Jesus. And so no matter what I'm struggling with in life, my son is in rebellion. How does Jesus treat somebody in rebellion? And I pray to God and say, God, help me with my son, but show me how you would treat him. And as I'm reading God's word, he shows me truths, whether from Proverbs or from the Gospel of John or from the letter to the Ephesians, and he shows me. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. All right, I'm going to, because that's how my son would do it. All right, God, help me with that. Share the truth with them in love. Don't provoke them to anger. And you're starting to learn how to be a, a Christ-like parent, but I'm also learning about Christ because what he's asking me to do, I'm supposed to be imitating him. Christ is slow to anger, quick to listen. And then I realized, Jesus, when I cry out to him, he's attentive and he's quick to listen. Sometimes he's slow to speak, too, because I'm waiting for an answer. Well, you find out your neighbor's been cheating on, on their spouse and your best friends with them. And this is what most Christians do. That scum bucket dog, I knew it. I knew something was going on. He was shaving too much. <laughs> and we throw fire on it. And we throw fire on it, and then it blows up, and then we go, good riddance, he had it coming. Wait a minute, how does Christ deal with an adulteress? It's in our book. He's patient. He's understanding. He's loving. He calls it what it is. Go and sin. Do I condemn you? Did they condemn you? Yes. Do I condemn you? Go and sin no more. Are we supposed to pray for enemies? Because he's the enemy now. Cheated on my best friend. Do we pray for him? No. Do we slander him? Yes. And what Paul is saying is if we come to God's word and read it in light of everything I'm reading points to Christ and how Christ is and how Christ wants us to be, I will be strong and courageous. My heart will be turned to my Father because our Father's heart is turned toward us. That revival verse that I read to you, God's heart's always turned to us. He's turning our hearts back to Him, but it only comes as we engage in God's Word. And when we do that, He heals the what? The land. I'm going to close with an illustration, man. I'm going to give you this. Hey, guys, where's my men? My young men. Aiden. Where did Matthew go? Come here, big guy. Play football. I don't care what your mom says. Play football. There you go. If you're a father, stand up. If you're a father, stand up. Now, once you get this, you can sit down. I'm not going to embarrass you. So once you get it, you can sit down. It just helps the kids. Now, listen, there's instructions on the side of that. And I know you men, you're going to bust that box open. You're not even going to look at the instructions. It is supposed to be a magnet, but it only works if you don't have a phone case and every phone has a case on it. The reason we're giving you this is to put in your car to remind you of your most important truth. To be rooted and built up in Christ. When I was in high school, I wanted to go into bodybuilding. And uh, here you go. And my father, we were, me and my dad never were like super close, but every now and then he would do something that would blow my mind. 
and I wanted to be a bodybuilder. I'd seen Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone in the movies, and I wanted to look like that. And so I got into bodybuilding. We went to Mike's gym, and he got me hooked up at Mike's gym, and I was going there, and we were working out, and I was putting on muscle. And he took me to a bodybuilding competition. Have any of y'all ever been to that? Raise your hand. Oh. Now listen, I was pumped up. And not only that, there was a guy there named Lee Haney that was going to have a one-on-one meeting with a small group. And my dad had bought a spot in that meeting for me. Now the rest of you go, I don't know who Lee Haney is. Lee Haney was Mr. Olympia. He was the biggest, baddest bodybuilder that they had. He was the top of the top. Nobody could beat him. I think he won six or seven times. I can't remember how many times. In a row. Now, most bodybuilders are really short, no offense, and they talk like this. You see these big guys, and you go to see them, and they're got these little voices. It's kind of crazy. Lee Haney didn't have that. Lee Haney talked like this. And when he came in the room, His forearms were bigger than my thighs. He was a monster. His arms were just, I'm not exaggerating, they were massive. And I'm looking at him, and I'm looking at me, and I realized something right in that moment. I will never be that. He was 30 years old. He'd been doing it since he was 12 years old. And if you've ever been in bodybuilding, it is a way of life. You have to live, eat, sleep, drink it. And he had been doing it since he was 12 years old. And he was the most perfect man I had ever seen in my life. And I realized something in that moment. Dad took it to inspire me. It defeated me. Because every time I looked in the mirror... Every time I went to lift weights, I was lifting the heaviest I could, and that was nothing to him. And I couldn't get out of my head. I will never be good enough to be what? Mr. Olympia. Larry, what is that? You're all over the place today. Men, you're never going to be good enough to be a Christ-like man, ever. And if you think you are, you're fooling yourself. Because when people see Christ in the Bible, they drop down as dead men. They say things like this, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. Some of them just drop dead. Because when they see him as he is, in his holiness, in his perfection, in his love, in his heart, in who he is, it's overwhelming. And if we want to be good dads with a heart for God, What we have to do as men is to keep Christ in front of us so that every day we do this. I am not who I should be. And the only way I'm ever going to be this is to let him live through me. That's what Paul's saying. Your theology is not going to save you. Your philosophy is not going to save you. All the works you want to do is not going to save you. Being a good person is not going to get you to heaven. Everything's Christ. And when you read your Bible, everything's Christ. And when you pray, everything is what? Christ. And it should be a dependence to where it's no longer I who lives, but Christ that lives through me. You want to be a good dad? Read about Christ. And say, God, help me to be that. I went to Mike a couple years ago. He hadn't seen me since high school. And he paid me a compliment. He walked over to me and he he grabbed my shoulder. He said, Larry, you got some muscle now. (laughs) And I said, no, Mike, that's fat. (laughs) And he said, Larry, no, it's not. You've got muscle in there, and I know it. We just got to get the fat off. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passing away. And behold, all things are becoming new. Christ wants to make us into the men he birthed us to be, if you will. 
We were wonderfully and fearfully made. And when we were born, we came into the world by his design. And he's saying, I want to make you the man I want you to be. I see you differently than you see yourself. But the only way you're going to get there, man, is focus on what? Christ. So if you will take that thing and put it in the car to remind you every day, I need to be rooted and built up in who? Christ. Amen, men? We all fall short. Skipper especially, but all of us fall short. Um, I'm going to have the men stand after we... We're not going to sing today. We're going to pray. And um, we're going to have you stand up, men. Let's do this. I'm going to have you stand up right now. Father, stand up. And I'm going to pray for you. And then, wives, take these men out to eat. Children, if you haven't bought a gift, get them something. Father's Day is the lowest celebrated holiday of all. Did y'all know that? We rank low, men. We fall behind Arbor Day, Halloween, (laughs) Fourth of July, and yet God says y'all are the ones that are going to bring the nation back. We live in a world that puts you down. You're not down. We need to bring you what? Up. And part of the reason we're down is there's been a lot of bad dads. We need good ones. So let's focus on Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for these men. It is hard doing a Father's Day message. And oftentimes what we end up doing is beating up on men, saying they need to do better. And they're trying the best that they can. And they're trying to be everything their wife needs them to be and to be the dad they need to be and to be what work needs them to be. And Father, sometimes we're spread so thin we don't have time to see what you want us to be. I pray that you would just help these men that are standing here today to place those reminders and every day spend time in your word to get to know you better, Jesus. Help us to talk about you, Jesus, and help us to share with others what you've done for us. I pray that you'd bless their families and their home and their legacies and help all of us to be good dads. And we ask all this in the precious name Jesus Christ and all God's people said, amen. Amen. Hug somebody before you go home. Hug a dad. Even if it's not yours, hug them.